I think we're ready to begin. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So good morning, colleagues. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program, my name is Asa Margolis, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webcast this morning. So in case you forgot what you signed up for over the next hour and a half or so, we will be discussing the upside down transport, transporting the prone patient. But more specifically, we're gonna start the session today with a discussion about the physiology associated with proning and a brief review of some of the early evidence behind proning. This will take us into a discussion about why we prone and what additional consideration should be accounted for with respect to the COVID-19 patient. We will then move into how we go from concept to implementation, which will transition us nicely into our case-based discussion where we will review three cases that we've selected from over a dozen prone patient transports the team has done since the start of the pandemic. Ultimately, we want to conclude with your questions, but to allow all the speakers to get through their presentation, we'll be holding questions until the end, but please feel free to use the chat function to type them in so we can make sure to get to as many of them as possible. So I want to take a moment to introduce the virtual panel for our session today in order of speaking appearance. So my name is Asa Margolis. I'm the medical director for the Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program. I'm joined by two of our other medical directors, Dr. Troncoso and Dr. Garfinkel. Uh, following Dr. Garfinkel, we will hear from our nurse manager, Sean Troutman, who in partnership with our nurse educator, Ben Kitania, were really the brains behind this entire operation. We'll then move into the cases with the first presented by Sam McKay, one of our flight nurses. Following, we'll hear a presentation from one of our ground nurses, Holly Safran, and then conclude with a case from Bridget Forrester, who while she looks like she's about to jump onto a helicopter, she's actually one of our ground nurses as well. So as with many talks, we too have our disclaimers. Uh, number one, this material that we're gonna provide to you today is a summary and not meant to be comprehensive. This information that we talk about today does not and should not supersede the recommendations or decisions of your EMS agency leadership or medical director. And we're gonna be discussing a number of medical products today, but have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay, so I'm gonna hand this off to Dr. Troncoso to get started for a discussion about some of the early evidence uh, and physiology associated with proning. Dr. Troncoso. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Ruben Troncoso, and I'll be talking about the physiology behind the prone patient and a little bit of the evidence of why we do what we do. So the story behind the prone position really begins in the 1960s in Montreal, Canada. A group of five researchers, really all they did, they looked at healthy lungs, but they wanted to see how body position changes your ventilation and perfusion ratios. So they made eight healthy patients breathe in xenon, and then they did some basic pulmonary function tests, and they put patients in left lateral decubitus, right lateral decubitus, prone and supine. And all they showed was that perfusion and ventilation ratios, they actually changed with body position. All right? And this is in the 1960s, um, not really discussing at all in terms of the sick lungs. About 10 years later, you have A. Charles Bryan, who just in a quick commentary at a pediatric conference mentioned um, the prone position and patient position in terms of pulmonary function and actually sick patients, but really discussing pediatric patients, didn't really do any you know, scientific inquiry, just kind of mentioning um, this to, to other colleagues. And interestingly enough, A. Charles Bryan um, is really cited in literature today in terms of uh, inspiring some of the stuff in terms of the prone position. So this is where it really takes off. So in 1960s, you talk about prone position, 1970s, it's mentioned. You don't hear about it too much, but then in the early 1990s, um, Luciano Gattotoni, uh, he really starts uh, the process going. So he starts using CT scans to show what physiology happens in the prone position. And what he showed really was that the key of the prone position, um, if you know, it may essentially really be due to increasing the distribution or evening out, I should say, evening out the distribution of ventilation. So this is the key graph here. Uh, the bottom line, okay, that's the prone position. That's the prone patient uh, marked with the triangles. 
Um, and the top line marked with circles uh, is the supine patient. And going from left to right, you're going from anterior to posterior. And on the y-axis, it's basically um, showing how much aeration you're having through inflated tissue fraction. And as you can see, that line on the bottom, the prone patient, is much more steady and much more evenly distributed be uh, between the lung, as opposed to the supine patient. Um, you know, you have this very um, steep angle going from anterior to posterior, showing that the distribution of ventilation is not really evenly distributed. All right, so why does that matter? So the belief is, right, if you evenly distribute your ventilation um, by, by gravity, right, once you pull off the heart, you know, the heart's going to come up in a favorable position, the abdomen, the abdominal contents are going to be a more favorable position. And the actual lung tissue itself, sick lungs right, are heavier lungs, and gravity, um, when you use it to your benefit, is going to hope, uh, hopefully open stuff uh, up for you. And really, it has to do with evening out the ventilation distribution. So when you do that, you get decreased over distension, you improve your secretion clearance, you're going to increase aeration, and with the ultimate goal of improving arterial oxygenation. So that's the physiology and that's the thought process uh, behind the prone position, but does it work? All right, so we're gonna go through just a couple trials that, um, that are the popular ones. So in 2009, you have JAMA. Um, and when they looked at all comers, there really wasn't a, prone position really didn't make too much of a difference. Uh, when you look at all comers in terms of ARDS, there wasn't too much of a difference at all. But when you start looking at subgroup analysis, and that's what this paper did, of uh, the moderate ARDS and severe ARDS, they started seeing a trend um, towards beneficial uh, mortality in the prone position group. Again, not statistically significant by no means, but 37.8 versus 46.1 percent mortality at 28 days, favoring the prone position, and at six months, 52.7 versus 63.2 percent mortality, favoring the prone position. Again, nothing to, to, to write home about, but they started seeing a trend. And really, they started seeing better mortalities in the sicker lungs. Now, this is where you know, it really takes off. In 2013, this is probably the best evidence for the prone position, um, you get another group, and they really hone in on just severe ARDS um, and the prone position. And what this group showed was a very favorable mortality benefit for the prone position. Here you have 16% versus 32.8%. And they really focused on severe ARDS, P to F ratios, less than 150. And I will say there is a caveat, you know, obviously with time, we're getting better with managing the ventilator. In the 2009 study, they were targeting tidal volumes around eight per kilo. Um, in this study, you know, four years later, they tried to bring the, vol the tidal volumes a little more down with target uh, tidal volumes of six per kilo. All right, so those are two RCTs, um, but you know, one RCT or two RCTs doesn't really give you the answer. But this study, systematic review by the American Thoracic Society, um, is the highest level of evidence, right? You take the highest quality of RCTs, you pull the data in, and you see what you get. So when, you, when we look at the data, I think it's supposed to come up any second now. When we look at the data, um, really, again, when they looked at all the studies and pooled everyone, you do see a mortality benefit, but really in only the sickest lungs. When you look at all comers, when they pulled the data again, that mortality benefit, you don't really see it there. So in summary, we think the physiology, the benefit of the prone position is really evening out your distribution of ventilation, you decrease over distension, increase aeration, and the effect is really seen in the severe ARDS group, your PDF ratios are less than 150, and that may be due to you know, sick lungs or heavier lungs, so you're getting that better gravity uh, effect on the lung, opening up everything a little bit easier. And the mortality benefit seems to be there again from severe ARDS. Back to you, Margolis. All right, thank you, Dr. Trucoso. That was a really wonderful discussion about proning, the associated physiology, and some of the original evidence. Uh, now we're going to transition to COVID-19, and Dr. Garfinkel will set the stage for why and how this has become such an important component in the management of COVID-19 patients to the extent that it has really found its way into transport medicine. 
All right, thank you. Good morning. So as the pandemic started, uh, we were seeing a lot of patients with just profound hypoxia. Um, and a lot of these patients had pretty minimal symptoms and they were called the happy hypoxic patients. We were discovering that we could prone these patients, these patients that were awake, uh, called self-proning. And a lot of times we'd be able to avoid intubation. But unfortunately, many of them ultimately needed to be intubated anyway. And we treated these patients like our typical IRDS patients, because that was what we were most familiar with back at the beginning of the pandemic back in March and April. What Lifeline discovered was starting to become an issue was we would have a lot of these patients that were prone, very, very sick. They could not be supinated because they're so tenuous. And they would be requesting, these outside hospitals would request transfer to the main Johns Hopkins Hospital. And Lifeline, of course, doing all the transfers would now be tasked with the goal of transporting a prone patient, which we had never done before. And to be honest, we didn't really know if anyone had done it before. So late uh, in the spring of last year, we discussed, we decided we needed to make a, a plan about how we were going to do this. So the first thing we did was to go back and look at the literature. And what we discovered was, well, there's not really that much that has been done before. Um, in the early 2000s in Finland and Australia, there were 15 ground transports of prone patients. And this was done with a, a physician during the transport, which is not the model that we run. We do a, a nurse and a paramedic model. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, our partners at Stat Medevac um, did do a uh, did seven transports of prone patients with uh, the nurse paramedic model, which is what we use. And that they were successful without any complications. So we did feel that we'd be able to do this. And then in 2018, there were two helicopter transports in Canada where the tra transport crews actually initiated proning, which was the first time that had been written about in the literature. So we felt like there was not a lot of data on this, but this was something that we felt could be done safely, had been done safely, and really needed to be done because we knew as the pandemic became worse and worse, and as we experienced, there were going to be more patients that would need to be transported in a prone position because we just would not be able to transport them in a supinated position. So next, Dr. Margolis will talk about how we went through the process of uh, developing this protocol and what the protocol actually is. Thanks so much, Dr. Garfinkel. That really set the stage nicely for why this has become such an important part of the care we offer to some of our most critically ill patients during transport. So as everybody heard from our first two speakers, proning is supported in the literature for the appropriate patient. And thus we felt the need to bring this care to our patients no matter where they are. So our success really begins with the Lifeline Communication Center where the communication specialist triages all incoming requests for transfer. So if appropriate based on the clinical scenario, they will ask a series of three questions to determine if proning may be an option for this patient that we've been requested to transport. We use the following three criteria. So number one, has the patient been prone within the last 24 hours? We ask the specialist to obtain a most recent ABG to determine the P to F ratio. Uh, for those that are not familiar with this term P to F ratio, this is essentially the arterial oxygen content divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen that the patient is receiving. Uh, the P to F ratio is really a powerful objective tool to identify acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and help determine the severity of ARDS. Uh, we also utilize um, patient ventilator settings as a predictor of who may need to be prone when we arrive. So as you see, we use an FiO2 of greater than 70% and a PEEP of greater than 10. Uh, we felt the and was an important part here to help us strike the balance between sensitivity and specificity, uh, although know that this is certainly not set in stone. So from this point, a uh, call is made to the medical director on call and possibly also the supervisor on call to discuss the case. So generally speaking, if one of these criteria is met, a three-person team will be dispatched to get the patient from the referring facility. We'll discuss in a bit why we chose to utilize a three-person team for these transports. Um, you know, I think it's also important to point out that we are not committing the team to transporting the patient prone at this stage, but in fact, sending them with the right resources. So if it's clinically indicated, they have the resources to do so. Uh, I'm sure all of you listening who are familiar with transport medicine or EMS in general, know that it is not uncommon to find something different when you arrive at patient's side than what the initial information conveyed. 
So I do want to mention that just because we send the resources to prone the patient does not mean it's a must. must. We place a tremendous amount of emphasis on optimizing the patient prior to making the decision to prone, because while it can be done safely, and we've demonstrated that, there are associated risks. So with respect to the ventilator, we ensure protective lung ventilation strategies, in certain cases, accepting acidemia in the form of respiratory acidosis. We try to optimize oxygenation while integrating tools such as the patient compliance from the ventilator to help determine their PEEP of best compliance, as you will hear about in the cases, as well as considering metrics like driving pressures. But you know, also we want to make sure that the patient is well sedated and if needed, pharmacologically paralyzed to maximize ventilator synchrony. But even after all of that, proning may still be indicated. Um, and we really just consider this to be another tool in the toolbox of our lifeline clinicians. Also, we find that a number of these patients are receiving inhaled pulmonary vasodilators due to their profound degree of hypoxemia. And clearly this adds another layer of logistical challenges, which will also be discussed in the cases that are upcoming. So we have a fairly in-depth protocol, uh, but the highlights are listed here. So our goal is to use this for patients who have moderate to severe ARDS as defined by a P to F ratio of less than 150. But ultimately we are doing this to achieve the best level of oxygenation for the patient while minimizing, while minimizing exposure to high FiO2 in PEEP. So with respect to exclusion criteria, this is certainly not an all-inclusive list, but a few of them are listed here. So elevated intracranial pressure or the need to transport the patient with their head elevated is clearly an exclusion criteria uh, for this protocol. Additionally, obesity, but specifically obesity is used as, as an exclusion criteria but that is up to the discretion of the team if it would preclude the emergent supination of the patient if that becomes necessary during transport. And pregnancy is also generally considered a contraindication. So once the decision is made that proning is needed, our focus really shifts to mitigating potential complications. You're gonna hear more about this and how we do this specifically in the case-based discussion uh, but they are typically the ones that we see here listed on the slide. So we want to mitigate uh, dislodgement or migration of the endotracheal tube or other lines like central venous catheters. We want to prevent kinking uh, or compression of the endotracheal tube or catheters like central venous catheters or arterial lines. We pay very careful attention to the skin and preventing skin breakdown because these patients are at risk of facial edema being in the prone position. Uh, we take care to protect the eyes to avoid things like corneal abrasions, and we prepare for what to do if the patient has a cardiac arrest during transport. So although many of you know that the effectiveness in CPR in the prone position is not completely known, for those patients who are in the prone position with an advanced airway in place, it may be reasonable to avoid turning the patient to the supine position unless you're able to do so without the risk of disconnecting equipment and potentially aerosolizing uh, viral particles. So if unable to transition the patient to a supine position, the defibrillator pads are placed in the posterior lateral or even anterior posterior position, and you provide CPR with the patient remaining prone with the hands over the T7 to T10 vertebral bodies. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into this in a bit uh, when Sean Troutman discusses these emergency procedures. So as a medical director and as medical directors out there, there could be clinical practices that we would like to implement for patient care. However, making them happen and doing so efficiently and effectively is a completely different story. Being left alone to even consider implementing this kind of thing would leave me with soul crushing pain all the way on the right side of our Dr. Fauci pain scale. But if you're lucky enough to be surrounded by people smarter than you, such as a brilliant nurse educator, and brilliant nurse manager, well then you end up all the way on the left side of the scale like I did all the way over there with no pain. So as you will see, ultimately it was the education and training associated with the resources that led to the success of this intervention. So this is now a great time to transition to our nurse manager, Sean Troutman, who will take you through from concept to implementation and really everything in between. 
Hello, my name is Sean Troutman. So what happens when your theory goes upside down? Here, right? here we are, uh, Dr. Mark Ollis and Dr. Garfinkel and uh, Dr. Uh, Truncoso have come up with this great idea about let's, uh, let's go ahead and prone these patients for transport. And this is my face, <laughs> right? And not only is this my face, but this is the face of, uh, of our staff, right? Because um, this is not something we've done before. And if you've been in the EMS world, and for any number of, uh, of years, uh, one of the mantras, there's lots of mantras in EMS, and one of the mantras is never transport somebody on their belly, right? Uh, there has, there's been uh, bad outcomes uh, when that's happened because typically uh, what's happened in the past is people are being transported like that for um, restraint purposes. Uh, people that are um, uh, agitated and violent sometimes get put, uh, have gotten in the past put face down and handcuffed and there's been some bad outcomes with that. Um, so, so it's one of those things that we really had to overcome some of the fear and the resistance. Uh, and we got a lot of questions of, you want us to do what? Um, and, and, I, and I think they thought we were crazy. So we came up with some ways to, to sort of address those things um, and get to it. And the first thing that we think of is what could possibly go wrong, right? And we don't wanna set up, um, um, there's lots of things that could go wrong as Dr. Margolis discussed, right? There's, there's lots of risks, um, um, but we believe that, uh, you know, if we don't put the liquor with the guns, we can mitigate some of those, uh, those risk factors um, and we can make it, uh, make it safe, but, uh, make, make it a safe uh, procedure. So, um, but it's important to, to really sit down and think through uh, very carefully, what are the possibilities um, um, and what things really could go wrong in this situation. So in addition to the, um, to the, um, the potential complications that Dr. Margolis listed, you know, uh, we've got some uh, hemodynamic instability at times. People are worried if we start flipping people over or having it on their belly, what's that gonna do their hemodynamics? Um, you know, a lot of us have, have heard the, uh, the, the left turn of death if we've worked in, the, in any kind of cardiac environment, you sometimes just turning a patient to their left. Uh, will cause them to uh, become bradycardic and hypotensive. So what, what, what in the world is gonna happen when we put them on their stomach? Um, so that's a fear, arrhythmias, right? Uh, I think some of the biggest things we worry about is just pulling lines out. That's a big uh, risk that we have in our daily uh, operations. That's a big thing we have to be concerned about and how much more difficult is it gonna be here. And then um, um, airway, of course, I think that's the biggest fear that people have. Is how am I going to get to the airway? How am I going to suction them? How am I going to, uh, uh, what happens if something goes wrong? Um, that's a, those are the big things. And then there's the risk of uh, patient injury, whether that's uh, skin breakdown or whether that's, uh, if you don't put them in the wrong, uh, right spot, you've got, you could cause uh, joint damage and things like that. And then, and then our own staff injury, if we're having people um, move patients in sort of awkward and ways that they're not used to. You know, could we potentially have uh, staff uh, injure themselves? Um, so those are all things that um, we had to look at and try to mitigate and also look at and think um, what's the risk and what's the benefit of this procedure? And those the, does the benefit of um, having somebody transported in the prone position, position um, does it really benefit the patient enough to, to uh, outweigh the risk? And you know, it's, it's, the, old, uh, it's the old thing just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should do something, right? So we have to think about, um, should we do this, right? So that was all in this planning phase. So as we, as we, uh, as Dr. Marvel has discuss, discussed briefly, um, really this all comes down to the people, the people you have in your organization and making sure that you're using the right people and the right resources and everybody is doing their job um, to the best of their abilities, which they always do. So we have wonderful people here at Lifeline and I got to use this opportunity to, to just send a shout out to all the staff here because um, they were great, right? I mean, they had concerns, they had questions, right? Which are good things. We want people to ask those questions. We want people to, uh, to ask the hard questions beforehand so that we don't end up in a bad situation during, during this process, right? So they're asking us questions and they, and then they really jumped on board and started learning this and, um, and started doing this really, really well. So uh, everybody has been fantastic here at Lifeline and we couldn't have done it without them. Um, so Hopcom, uh, their role is to uh, really identify the resources and provide um, the resources needed and provide the, the ongoing support. And they've done a fabulous job of that. Um, um, sometimes they, they get people online to help them. Um, our comm staff are all EMTs uh, and they, um, 
Um, they do a, a wonderful job of sort of identifying what resources might be needed and getting those uh, hooked up. Um, they also, uh, we have some, uh, some protocols where they will, they'll automatically call either the medical director or myself um, if they have uh, questions or need help working through what kind of resources to send. Uh, so we have some, some things set up for that. And then our medical command physicians um, who are on this call, uh, Dr. Margolis, Dr. Garfinkel, Dr. Troncoso, and we have one more, Dr. Kemp, uh, have been fabulous. Uh, they provide all the support we need. They're very gracious on the phone when we tell them uh, sort of information that it might, might be a little disjointed. They're really good at taking all this information that I'm giving them and putting it, putting, putting it in together, a, a really nice picture, and helping sort through and helping me uh, figure out what needs to happen. And then the medical crew themselves, we have, of course, the EVO, um, and then these are going to be SCT transports. So we'll have a paramedic and a nurse. And then uh, we always take a third crew member, uh, uh, medical crew member with us. And that could be another EMT, could be another paramedic, another nurse. Um, and we've um, on multiple occasions also taken RT. So anybody else in the back. Um, and the reason we take that additional person is to help, um, is to help, um, with the movements. Uh, sometimes you just need extra hands. And also really uh, as a safety pr uh, precaution, if we were to need to emergently supinate the patient in the back of the ambulance, uh, we, we really want to have a third person there to help us do that. So now we've thought through the problems. We've thought about what could go wrong because um, you know whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So now we got to prepare for it, right? We got to figure this out. So uh, one of the things that we came up with, and this is actually something that we didn't uh, initially have, but we came up as we started doing some of our cases, um, we came up that this would be a good idea. We put together uh, what we, we just call the prone pack, right? And it includes a couple of things, uh, some blankets. Um, we use a blanket to, to roll up and make a big, big body pillow essentially so that we can uh, position our patients correctly. So we have those blankets in there uh, for them. Uh, we have some three inch tape so they can tape it up. Um, use um, some soft wrist restraints so we can get uh, the patient's arms in the correct position. Um, and then we use uh, what's called the Z-Flow pillow, which is um, sort of a gel filled pillow that is moldable and you can put it uh, in many different sizes and uh, I'm not so sorry, not sizes, positions, um, and get really get the, the patient's head in a really good position um, uh, with that. Um, and then we use a, we use a Thomas tube holder. That's, the, that's a, uh, the device we use for tube securement and it works really well for these patients as well. So we keep that in the, um, in the pack as well. And then we use the AirPal mattress. Um, and that AirPal mattress, if no, somebody's not familiar with it, is basically a, um, it's a lateral transfer device and it, it includes a, a pump and a mattress. And uh, the pump will actually blow up the mattress. It's like an air mattress, but the bottom of the pad has tiny perforations in it. And um, if anybody remembers playing air hockey when they were a kid, it's basically like the bottom of it's like an air hockey table. So it creates a, a layer of air underneath the pad and allows for very easy uh, lateral transfer of patients. And we use that uh, just to help us out because we may not have as many people to help with the lateral transfer. And since this is such a sort of a high, potentially high risk uh, environment, we don't want people pulling really hard. Uh, we wanna make it as easy as possible. So this is that's the device that we use for those. Um, all right, and then the preparation of the patient, all right? How are nurses wired, right? And you got the emergency department nurses and the ICU nurses, right? So um, some of this is uh, uh, this whole process of proning and transporting the prone patient, it really comes down to your preparation. It really comes down to your planning and your logistics, right? So, um, so when we get to the bedside, uh, we wanna take a look at the patient. We wanna assess them first, right? And, the, and you know, uh, airway starts with an A, so we always do that first, right? Airway assessment and securement. Um, uh, you'll see in some of our case studies, but not all of our patients have been uh, have had their airway secured in a way that we think is appropriate for transport, and especially in the prone position. So we want to make sure that we assess that right off the bat. Um, and that's why we include these Thomas suit holders in the prone pack. We have them in our other bags too, but we want to make sure that that's top of mind for people uh, to remember to, to do that and put that on if they need it. Uh, we want to check their hemodynamics and we want to pre-plan for um, for any problems, right? So maybe the patient is not on any pressors, but we think that they may become hypotensive when, when we prone them or when we transfer them. So we might have some pressors ready to go um, for us or some atropine or some uh, uh, push dose pressors or something like that. Um, 
just a quick note about that. We found sort of anecdotally that most patients, um, uh, if they do uh, have any kind of hemodynamic instability, which has been pretty rare, it's been pretty transient. And, and usually you can get them through that phase and then they do they, they tolerate very well. Um, so, uh, sedation and paralytics is very important, right? Obviously, we don't want patients moving around um, too much at all while we're doing this, and we want them to be uh, compliant with the vent, so we're going to assess those things. And then our line management. Here's this picture with the uh, all the cables here. Uh, we were really have, this is, this is crucial, because if we don't uh, line our patients up correctly, um, and we look like the emergency department <laughs> nurses, right? And I was an emergency department nurse, so I can say this is true. Um, what's gonna end up is when we turn this patient or transfer this patient, the patient's gonna just get wrapped up in their cords, right? So we need to make sure that everything um, is lined up and, uh, and won't wrap up with them as we burrito them over. Um, and actually, we're not quite like a ICU nurse either. We're somewhere in between in the transport world because we wanted to get things lined up but we want to actually get rid of as much stuff as possible. And then we're going to do a, a skin assessment. And this is especially important if we're actually the ones proning the patient, because uh, once we prone the patient, you know, it's, it's potential they're going to be uh, on their stomach for up to 12, 16 hours um, uh, at a time. And that's how long patients typically need to stay on their stomachs before you you bring them up. So in that time, really nobody's going to be able to get to their chest to assess their skin. So um, <clears throat> Although this, this sounds like something that, you know, maybe we don't care about. We're all about saving lives and who cares about the skin. This is actually something that's pretty important to do if you're, if you're the one uh, proning the patient. Um, and you want to make sure that the skin is intact, but also that you don't leave anything that can cause skin breakdown. So we're going to remove all uh, electrodes and things like that to make sure that they're, they're not going to cause skin breakdown. All right, and then here's the procedure itself, right? So we've got the, we're thinking about what can go wrong. We're preparing for it. Now, how do we actually do it? So um, we actually created in, in our policy and in our, in our protocols, we created uh, some checklists. Um, I think all in this field, we all love checklists. And I think this is a really good application for it um, because it's allowed us to do a couple of things. It allowed us to standardize the way we do it and make sure that everybody had a shared mental model, right? Um, the, one of the biggest, uh, keys in this whole thing is 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 not only preparation, but also communication, right? And this allowed us to be uh, all on the same page. Literally, we had a page, and uh, all on the same page, and all talking through these things together, and making sure that everybody was uh, was knew what was going to happen next. So, uh, so these are our checklists. Um, we do have two versions because we really can encounter two 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 uh, two different things when we arrive. We can either come and the patient's already prone, and we're going to continue that patient prone. Um, and so we have the checklist that's on the left hand side, uh, or we can get there and the patient may be supine. And we say, you know what, this patient is not oxygenating well, and we actually need to train, we need, we actually need to prone the patient for the transport. Um, and so in that case, we have another checklist, right? Because the procedures are slightly different. So we had to make sure that we, uh, we accounted for both. Uh, so now um, you'll hear me talking another in another format. We create a little vi uh, video for our training purposes. Um, so we thought this would be a good thing to just show you right now. Just two two disclaimers. We created this uh, early on in the in the pandemic. So uh, it was before some of the masking mandates. You'll see I don't have a mask on. Um, that was before yeah, all this stuff started. Uh, uh, but we realized how important it was. Second thing is. Um, something that bugs me as I watch it, the, the mannequin's foot is twisted over to the side. So just make sure your patient's foot don't look twisted like that. Now we're going to put the air pal underneath the patient so that for the transfer itself, we'll actually be able to benefit, use, uh, use the air pal for our lateral transfer. It makes it much easier. Okay, so at this point the air pile is ready, Amber's uh, moving the head, I'm probably just going to move the pillow out at this point so that we have enough room to uh, look at the airway and keep the airway in line, make sure everything is um, set up, nothing's going to pull, and then we'll get our air pile unit ready. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to line up my stretcher with the bed, so again, in height, and I'm going to make sure that the top of the patient's head is at the top of my stretcher. So once everything's ready to go. Don't forget to actually connect the patient in. You want to do it too tightly? Yep. Okay. 
Okay, and then make sure uh, everybody ready? Okay. Amber, are you in a good position? So if we're all ready, we can go ahead and turn the unit. Now the patient is on our stretcher, lateral move is completed. I'm going to actually start planning my turn. So now is the time where I'm going to remove anything that's not necessary. So if it's got IV fluid running that can be paused, I'm going to pause it and I'm only going to keep my uh, central drips going. Same thing with any other tubes. If I can disconnect the um, uh, NG tube from suction, if I can move anything that, that can be removed, I remove it. If it can't be removed, you have to figure out how is it going to be, um, how is it going to go in the turn. So your airway should be coming off the top of your head, and you also want to think about which way the patient is going to turn. We're going to be turning this patient towards me, so the airway, the way it is now, is going to end up under the patient's head. So it's going to go off the top, but we want to sort of flip it over to the other side, so Amber can hold it up there, so that it's going to be away from the, uh, away from the turn. Right? And then the same thing with all my... Uh, other lines. Other lines, the easiest place is to run them straight down the bottom of the bed. Um, uh, they're all the way at the bottom. Then I'm going to remove my EKG stickers. Um, I'm going to remove the, the actual leads themselves and also take off the stickers because the stickers will cause breakdown, right? And then I pull them off and then the rest of my monitoring, I'm going to want it to run out the bottom so that it doesn't get tangled with anything if possible. So now my patient's ready to go, so we're going to have four people for this uh, turn. I'm going to have one person at the head, so Amber is our, uh, our person who's going to be controlling all the movements because she is controlling the airway. Dennis is going to be on the hospital bed side, and then Bridget and I are going to both be on the other side. So now we're going to get our stretcher and move it, um, move it here. And then a couple things I want to think about positioning. One, I want the two beds to be the same height, basically, they're as close as I can get them. And then I want to make sure that uh, my stretcher is positioned in so that the head is going to remain right here, right at the head, and the patient is going to roll right on this roll. So right now I'm going to move this z flow pillow. Now we're going to be, yeah, and we're going to tuck the arm underneath a little, just a little bit, because this is the way we're going to roll the patient, so we don't want the arm getting caught on anything. And now the first step will be to pull the patient to the edge of the stretcher, um, and Amber is going to call that, and we're going to make sure we listen to her, and it's on her count. Okay, pulling to the edge, one, two, three. All right, so now we're at the edge of the stretcher. Now I'm going to make sure that, that arm remains tucked. And then the next thing will be to pull up. One, two, three. And then uh, we'll just keep coming down nice and slow until the patient comes right on top of this roll. And the whole time, Amber is going to be controlling this head and this airway. And I can help her at this point. So I'm going to hold on to the airway and lay this down. And then she's going to take this Z-Flow pillow that's behind her. And she's going to uh, position the heads. So there is our, uh, our demonstration on how to do the turn itself, uh, which is, uh, or the transfer, which is, is sort of the, the most nerve wracking part of the procedure. But uh, one of the most, uh, one, one of just as important part is how do we position the patient once we get them over onto our stretcher? And this is where some of this risk mitigation comes in as well. Um, on the left-hand side of this slide, you see the full prone position. And that's sort of the position that I think most of us thought of initially when we, uh, when we talk about proning. I know that for me in my practice, that was the most common um, position that I place people in um, in the ICU and such. Um, so that in, that in that case, the patient is full on on their belly. Um, their, their, their face and head are straight down and their hands are up. Um, and that is, uh, that is definitely good for the lungs, it's good physiologically, but it has some limitations. Uh, uh, and really the biggest limitation is access to the airway and how much you have to position the patient. So in order to make this work and so that the airway is not kinked, you really need to pad the chest and the hips up quite a bit, sort of build that patient up so that there's room for the head to be down and the airway to come out. But even with that, it's still difficult to get to the airway. 
Um, and typically when you see this, um, you can see the square there is typically like a, a foam pillow. Um, you'll see these in the, in the ORs a lot. Basically it's a foam pillow with a hole cut, cut out and it has a little slot for the airway to come out to the side, right? So you get to the, you get, you can hook up your ventilator, but if you need to suction uh, the mouth or you need to actually just look at the airway, um, very difficult to get to. So, you know, looking at our uh, initial mantra, well, what can go wrong? Uh, this probably is not a great position for us because it, it allows for um, a lot to go wrong. So what we decided on, it's actually the position that, that, that we use here at Hopkins in the ICUs a lot, is what's called the swimmer's position. And you can see one of our uh, flight nurses, Aaron Berry, has uh, graciously decided to demonstrate this for us. Um, and you see that um, it's not quite a full prone. Uh, the patient is actually tilted up slightly. Um, it's kind of like a seventh, eighth prone. Um, and you can see the, uh, the roll, the blanket roll I talked about uh, earlier is what's used to sort of uh, have the patient tilted a little. And the real advantage of this is you can see we can turn the head sideways like this. And in this case, now we can, uh, we can really get to that airway and we can troubleshoot the airway, we can suction really well, we can visualize it, keep an eye on it. Um, and that's the main advantage of putting patients in this position. All right, so now we got the patient position. Uh, by the way, too, once you have the patient in this position, you can base, you can strap them in uh, the same way you normally would. You put the shoulder straps above them, and you can uh, and you can put the, the all the regular straps to keep them secure. But the next thing that always kind of comes up is 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 all right. What happens in a real emergency situation if my patient goes into cardiac arrest? What do I do if something happens with the airway dislodgement? What do I do? How am I going to fix that? Well, if the patient goes into cardiac arrest, um, um, we actually can uh, do CPR in the prone position. There is some literature to support this. Um, it's not the, um, you know, there's not a lot of, there's no randomized controlled trials, obviously, but uh, in an emergency situation, you can do it. So we wrote this into our protocol that if our patient went into cardiac arrest, as long as their airway is still in place, then we're gonna leave them in the prone position and we're going to, um, to do CPR with them, with them face down. And basically what we do is we remove the, uh, the roll and have them more on that full prone uh, side, still with their head turned to the side. Um, and we would just, we would do compressions on their back. Um, there's some evidence to say like, oh, if you put a, um, uh, like a saline bag under their sternum, that helps provide some counter pressure. You know, so if we can get that in there, we might try that. Um, Anecdotally, this is a rare event, it has never happened uh, sort of in our transports here that we've done, like in knock on wood. Um, but even in my, my clinical practice prior to this and, and some of the other nurses um, and, and all on our teams, um, a lot of our people have a lot of uh, experience proning patients. And it's, it's, it's actually been a pretty rare event that anybody has been, uh, goes into cardiac arrest while prone. Um, and, and I think the big reason for that is that, you know, Oxygen does a lot of really good things for your body. And if you are prone and therefore oxygenating better, it really can help, um, it can help make sure you prevent cardiac arrest. Um, so obviously if it's a cardiac problem, uh, it's not gonna change that, but if they're going into arrest because of respiratory uh, hypoxia and respiratory stress, then prone positioning really can help prevent that. Um, and then the next thing is the airway dislodgement. All right, so this, in this case, this is when we would do the emergency supination. It's really the main reason why we would ever want, uh, we would ever emergently supinate a patient um, is to be able to get to the airway. So we really, uh, we can get to the airway, we can, we can assess it, we can suction, but it'd be very difficult to intubate a patient like that. So if we lose their two, we got to flip them up so we can re, uh, re-secure that airway. Um, and in order to do this, uh, once again, we, we've never had to do this um, uh, in our practice so far, knocking again. Um, but if we did have to do this, we basically have to plan as if we're going to do it, because uh, once again, we need to make sure that the, uh, the cords are going to be in the proper position and all the, um, all the uh, IV lines are gonna, not going to get pulled out. Uh, we're, we're, this is an emergency situation, so we're not going to worry about the, the EKG leads as much. We're just we're going to flip them over, right, and, and get to the airway as soon as possible. But we don't want to rip out a central line in the process, right? So we need to make sure the lines are good. Um, there's actually some uh, some work that uh, if anybody's familiar with uh, the podcast and the group Heavy Lies the Helmet, they put out some really good uh, videos and kind of some recommendations about this a few years back. And we use a lot of their stuff of how do you prep the stretcher and how do you get ready in case you need to do it. So that, that link is actually going to go in the chat box so people can check that out later if they'd like. 
And then, um, you know, we have to make sure we train people and prepare them well. So uh, when we actually uh, did the education on this and the rollout, we, uh, we talked a lot about why we're doing it and um, really kind of giving people the rationale that this is why it's a good idea. And people saw it. You know, we really didn't have to do a lot of emphasis on that because they saw how sick these patients were. And they knew that if you, if you put them supine, the patient was going to deteriorate. So um, th that came easy. Uh, and then we did online videos. We did a simulation when we rolled it out. That's basically how we rolled these out is we did simulation practice. Uh, we brought crews in every day as they were just doing their shifts and we would, we would do the simulation. Um, then we had ongoing uh, sort of uh, refreshers on it and then we put it in our con edit. So we've just been hammering it and refreshing it. Uh, we were provided the resources that I talked about. We have people that were sort of super users with it that would go and help people for the first time. Um, uh, and that's kind of the ways we provided some support. Um, and then some of the big things is we, we, we try to do debriefings. We try to gain some lessons learned. And that's really what this whole uh, uh, webinar roundtable discussion is about too, is what are the things we've learned? Because even though I, as a critical care nurse, have actually done this a fair amount, before this, I had never done it in the transport uh, environment. So, you know, we can, we can theorize and we can plan as much as we want, but we need to look at reality. How do things actually go? What lessons did we learn? Where do we need to tweak things? Uh, so we try to do that and continue to do that. All right, thanks so much, Sean. That was an incredible explanation, an incredible presentation with a lot of practical considerations. So thank you so much. So we're now gonna transition into our first case, which is actually one of our more recent cases. As Sam will discuss in a moment, this patient was transported by air and done so in collaboration with our great partners from Stat Medivac. So Sam, uh, take it away. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so like you said, this is a, only a couple week old case. Uh, we, we did this one kind of after learning a bunch uh, about sort of how to treat these patients. Uh, so sent to uh, one of our outlying facilities for, uh, as you guys can see, a 44 year old uh, male, uh, not a big guy, um, puts his ideal body rate around 62 kilos um, and only about 70, uh, 78 kilos uh, real body weight. Uh, only history was diabetes, but kind of guessing there may have been more uh, given that he probably hadn't seen a doctor in a while, uh, like a lot of our patients. Um, diagnosis was, of course, hypoxic respiratory failure. He presented like every other hypoxic respiratory failure COVID-19 patients we, that we've seen in, over the last year. Um, so when I saw him, he was 19 days into, into his illness. Uh, we saw him on, uh, on day 19. Uh, he had about a four-day history of getting worse, uh, got intubated, and uh, required aggressive mechanical ventilation, uh, often on proning, and uh, he was on Velitri, uh when prior to to our arrival. Um, he had become hemodynamically in, unstable. Uh, it developed a uh, pretty profound tachycardia in the 140, 150s range, and uh, hypotension. Uh, so they ended up supinating him a, a little bit early from their normal 16-8 schedule to take him to uh, get a CTA for a potential PE. Um, and kind of in conjunction with that, they made the, the call to, uh, to John Hopkins for uh, ECMO eval. So that's sort of why we were going out to get him. Uh, so when we got there, we found him uh, supine. Uh, you can see his vital signs there. Uh, that rate of 109 is actually down from 140 uh, when we first walked in. Uh, typically the way we handle these calls uh, because of the precautions and, and all of that, we tend to do as much as possible outside the room as far as consulting and prepping as much equipment and all of that stuff. So he had lost about 30 points on his heart rate in the, in the time period between when I got there and when we got the monitor on him um, and had sort of had a subsequent drop in his blood pressure as well. Um, you can see his uh, ventilator settings there. So decently high PEEP, uh, pretty high minute ventilation. Uh, particularly for a guy that's uh, 62 kilos. Um, so that's over double what we typically run for, uh, for a minute ventilation. Um, and then this uh, ABG is actually the ABG we got when we, uh, when we showed up. This was a point of care uh, ABG that was done by our team. Um, so, and it's actually down or 
let's all let's call it worse uh, from a ABG that was gotten right as they rolled him. Uh, we saw him about 5:30, and this gas that I'm about to give you was drawn about 3:30. Uh, so that gas was uh, 7.1, 102 for the CO2, 76 for the O2, and 33 for the bicarb. Um, so in that couple hours, they had fixed his ventilatory uh, issues, but they had they had made his uh, oxygenation worse. Um, and some of the concern was um, that a combination of the diltiazem drip and his uh, progressing hypoxia um, had caused that drop in that heart rate that I mentioned. Uh, we were a little bit worried that that was trending down and sort of was a relative bradycardia. Um, so with those vent settings were a PIP of like 40s and I time of 0.6, a one to two IDE ratio and running a map of about 20. And that'll become important when we start talking about some of the changes that we decided to make. Uh, so we made a plan uh, with uh, the medical directors, uh, kind of called, gave them the rundown, kind of said, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, and what I got from them was essentially the plan was to continue all the medications uh, except for the dexamethamine and uh, the diltiazem. Um, and uh, kind of see what was going on there, optimize him on the ventilator with some ventilator settings, uh, optimizing his PEEP with a PEEP of S compliance study, uh, doing some changes to pressure control, eye time, those type of things. And we'll get into those in just a second. Um, and then uh, prone him. Once he was proned, assess whether he needed to go back on the Valitri. So when they rolled him to take him to, see, to get his CTA, they had taken him off uh, Valitri and they had not put it back on by the time we got there. Um, so that was sort of our progression of do this, then this, then this, and kind of see where you're at. Uh, because Hopkins has been very uh, weary of the aerosol risk with um, Valitri and any of the uh, aerosolizing uh, medications. Uh, and we did not have our nitric uh, with us because of uh, not knowing that he had been on the Valitri. That was not passed, uh, passed on to us. Um, so when we got in the room, we made some ventilator settings, uh, setting changes. The big thing is we did the PEEP of S compliance uh, study to see if uh, we could get a little more lung recruitment. Uh, they had recruited as much as long as possible. So we, we ended up staying at a PEEP of 14. Um, I did give up a little bit of minute ventilation, uh, got a goal of, or got a minute ventilation of around 13 um, in an effort to increase his oxygenation. Uh, we kind of optim or, uh, prioritized oxygenation over ventilation, uh, changed his eye time from 0.65 to 0.85 um, and upped his rate to achieve that minute ventilation. So ended up on an IDE ratio about one to one, uh, taking his, which got us a mean airway pressure jump from around 20 to about 27 um, on, on my ventilator. Um, and like I said, we, the kind of goal was to optimize or to prioritize oxygenation over ventilation. I gave up a little bit of ventilation and a little bit of uh, CO2 uh, for that. Um, then we proned him, we got him into the prone position. Um, and at that point, once we proned him with the help of all the staff uh, at the sending facility, because I was on the aircraft, so we didn't have that third person. Um, we ended up rolling him over and uh, saw a, between the ventilator settings, which we did prior to, to proning him and, and actually proning him, we saw a pretty uh, decent jump in his oxygenation. His SpO2 jumped from like the mid eighties uh, up to about 90, 91, 92 um, in the room. Um, and then we actually turned him over as high as 94. So we decided not to start the Bellitri. Um, I kind of felt comfortable that we were where we wanted to be and uh, we weren't going to add that that extra kind of layer to to this whole thing. So a couple lessons learned from this is uh, expect hemodynamic changes. I know Sean talked about it, uh, but when you roll somebody from their back to to their face, you uh, you can kind of expect some hemodynamic changes. Um, they, are, they tend to be transient. Uh, and uh, this gentleman did jump his, uh, his heart rate back into the 140s when we rolled him over. But subsequently his heart or his blood pressure went up. Um, so actually by the end of the, the flight, I was able to get his uh, neosinephrine drip off. 
Um, so kind of expect those hemodynamic changes. And uh, this is the first time I've seen an adult do what kids do, where they just jack their heart rate through the roof uh, to, to maintain blood pressure. Um, oxygen is an extremely, extremely strong inotrope and vasopressor. You oxygenate somebody, most everything else will follow. Uh, neuromuscular blockade uh, was already on this gentleman, uh, but this has been a lesson learned from a couple different prone transports we've done where uh, I had one back in the spring where we took the guy, he was actually already prone, put him on our stretcher prone. He didn't really like my stretcher. He didn't like bouncing down the hallway, uh, went into bigeminy, stopped ventilating uh, and got hypotensive. Uh, we gave him one squirt of uh, VEC and magically that fixed him. Uh, Vecuronium, the magic drug in that case. Um, and then uh, remove as much as possible for the transport. The only thing I left on this gentleman for that, or not transport, but that transfer to the, the prone position. Um, the only thing I left on this gentleman was an entitled CO2 to make sure I didn't pull his tube out, his A-line, and um, uh, the NEO. Uh, everything else we paused for the actual transport uh, or that actual flip. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of essentially take everything off because you'll be able to put it back in a couple minutes. All right. Thanks so much, Sam. That was a great case and a great discussion. Uh, so let's now shift gears to the ground side, and I'll turn it over to Holly for a discussion of a patient that we transported in December. So Holly, take it away. Good morning. Uh, so I'm uh, presenting a 49-year-old female. She was uh, 5'3", 111 kgs, making her BMI 43, so a little bit um, larger than Sam's patient. Her ideal body weight would have been around um, 52.4 kgs. Uh, her past medical history noted for Graves' disease and heart failure. And she came in with a diagnosis of hypoxic respiratory failure due to COVID-19. Her, um, she presented to the emergency department at the outside hospital initially on the 16th, actually on the 25th of December with worsening um, COVID symptoms. But her initial diagnosis was on the 19th, just myalgias, headache, and cough. Um, with initial symptoms on the 16th of December. Her positive PCR test was on the 19th and she was admitted on the 25th um, after her symptoms were worse and she had a fever, uh, headache, cough, nausea, diarrhea. Uh, and even though her CTA for her chest and her um, admission imaging were all negative for PEs, it did show a bilateral mul multifocal pneumonia. Um, upon admission, she didn't require much O2 support, just minimal uh, nasal cannula, but then her oxygen demand increased over her uh, um, stay, worsening hypoxia. They started her on BiPAP. They tried to do the heated high flow nasal cannula, and she uh, eventually got intubated on the 7th of January at the outside hospital and transferred to the ICU, where she was then sedated on propofol and fentanyl and with some intermittent levofed requirements. Um, and then on the 8th, she deteriorated pretty rapidly. Her P to F ratio, as we were speaking of before, um, decreased to probably the lowest in the 60s. Um, so they did put her into the prone position and start nitric oxide for her. So when we got to the outside hospital, our, um, our ground team was already there and I went with a safety officer. Uh, we did not know what, as Dr. Margolis was saying that the patient was prone or on nitric. So we called in additional personnel, um, including a respiratory therapist because at that point we weren't doing our own nitric and um, the equipment for the nitric uh, transport. So an RT came in and we had another safety officer come. Uh, so while we were waiting for the additional supplies and personnel, we just asked for um, additional so spare drips so we could prime our pumps. Basically before donning our PPE, we just wanted to get as much done outside before the rest of our team arrived. So we got our transport pump set up. We tried to make a tentative transport plan because um, per our protocols, we need to call for a medical consult with medical command through HOPCOM. Um, for a patient on nitric and in the prone position. So we kind of made a tentative plan between the EMT, the medic, and the nurse and our safety. We also did some calculations. Um, so if you see in your middle tile there, she was on pressure control with her pressure support at 24, her PEEP at 15, respiratory rate at 24, FiO2 of 80%. Her minute ventilation was in the eights to nines and she was pulling um, probably like 310s to 340s for her tidal volumes which for her ideal body weight of 
it was around right for six mls per kg. Um, so we were going to try and keep her on those ventilator settings. And then the um, gas that you see in the third tile there was post proning and post nitric. So I'll go into that in a minute. And then the vital signs on the left are all her vitals upon arrival. So pretty stable. Heart rate was in the 70s, blood pressure 117 over 84. MAP was 95. At this point, her levofed was off. She was fairly hemodynamically stable. Rate of 24 and satting 97% on an FiO2 of 80. And her nitric was at 20 parts per million at this point. Uh, so we called <clears throat> Hopcom and spoke with Dr. Margolis and Dr. Garfinkel. Um, basically patient presentation. She was very well taken care of at this outside hospital. She was being transferred to us for um, ECMO evaluation. So her vent settings were all appropriate for her. She was in the left swimmer's position. She looked very good. Skin was in good shape. Um, we had good access to her lines. At this point, she just had, she had the fentanyl, the probe, and the cystricurium, and the INO going, no longer the levofed. Uh, so we decided to keep her on the same vent modes, uh, keep her in the same, in prone position, not supinate her, uh, adjust her ET tube, put it on a commercial tube holder, as discussed previously, and um, keep her, all of her drips at the same rates because she was pretty well sedated for her paralysis. Um, Going back to the nitric, uh, for when we're talking about the P to F ratio, her prior P to F ratio had been down in the 60s. So they started her on the nitric and then the third tile on the previous slide showed her P to F ratio up to the one teens, which is almost twice as high. So it did make a pretty good difference. Um, let's see, okay. And then the other thing for our plan for transport. So prior to transport, we um, were going to reinforce the ET tube with a Thomas tube holder. So initially we sent in one of our team members while the RT was pre-op checking our vent and setting, um, you know, calibrating her nitric machine. He went in, he cleared the room to make room for all our personnel just for situational awareness. Got the patient on the transport monitor to make the numbers, make sure the numbers were all um, pretty consistent from one um, monitor to the other. Um, then we had the um, respiratory therapist go in and start setting all of her stuff inside. Uh, once we had our drips trans uh, transferred over to the transport pumps and with the patient, we took care of her ET tube. So it was taped circumferentially and it was pretty, it had probably been pretty secure, but someone had some questions earlier about increased secretions and chest physiotherapy when the patient's in the prone position. She had a lot of copious uh, secretions from both her nasal, her nares, and her oral um, airway. So we suctioned a lot and we decided to just put the commercial tube holder over her existing ET tube tape just for reinforcement. And then we also made sure we kind of suctioned before we moved her head and suctioned before we moved and made sure everything was available once we were in the unit. Um, because she was paralyzed, we were pretty uh, cautious moving her, especially just for, you know, C-spine protection. So we had three personnel doing that, uh, the RT putting the tube holder on and one of us really holding, making sure her body was okay and the other person watching C-spine. Um, and then we did place the Z-flow pillow that you can see under Erin's head there. Um, under the patient's head. So she had been left facing swimmers. So gradually we transitioned her over to a right facing swimmers position so that we would have better access to her airway from the side uh, seats in the ambulance and um, be able to adjust anything if there were any issues with it. Um, so the Z-Flow pillow was there. And while we were doing the rest of her packaging, you know, we rolled her carefully from side to side um, and placed the air pal. So I know you all saw it in the um, demonstration, but we only, usually when you use an air pal just for regular patient transfer, say for a bariatric patient, you would put that um, a designated part of the air pal under the patient's head. We use it a little differently for this and we had kind of have the top of the under the patient's clavicle around there so that we can have the Z-flow pillow under their head and have you know someone just managing the head and the airway as we move them over. So we were able to do that and to keep the existing um, 
kind of line management, the lines were off to the patient's um, left, which was the right side of the bed. And then we, um, when we transitioned the drips, we just kind of had them on the patient. So they were kind of center lying, so they would not get tangled. Um, let's see. And then as we were transitioning her over prior to moving to the stretcher, we did not put her on any of our respiratory equipment until the end, just for conservation of supplies and to make sure everything was good. After we moved her, you know, double checking her placement of her ET tube, changing her swimmer's position, um, putting that, that blanket roll under her right side. And um, her main access was a left femoral triple lumen central line where all of her drips were running. So while that she did end up kind of lying on that, we still had decent access to it. Um, so we have two poles on the IV, I mean, two poles on the stretcher. We put the IV pumps on the, the right side of the stretcher, the patient's left side. We did end up needing to put a pack rod on to the stretcher because um, of all the equipment where the vent went. The nitric was on the left side with the corrugated tubing to make sure there was enough slack. And then the um, monitor was on the left side rail to make room because the patient's head of bed was flat. So we couldn't put it at the head of bed like we usually do. And then, as I said, our last action was to move, um, transition the patient over to our transport nitric and um, ventilator. And her numbers looked fantastic on our vent as well. Still pulling the same minute ventilation and the same uh, uh, volumes, peak pressures were fine. We did not see the need to do a PEEP of best compliance because she was right on target. She was sick, but she was stably sick. And then, you know, just making sure she was packaged, as Sean said, you know, you don't want lines to be all tangled. We kind of do north south instead of east west and making sure she didn't have any excess um, EKG stickers on her anywhere. Um, interventions during transport, we didn't really have to do anything, as I said, with vent management. Um, a lot of our COVID patients, we really did, but she was. Right, right on appropriate settings and pulling appropriate numbers for where she was at and her gas was pretty decent for someone as sick as she was. Um, the only issues we had was the uh, IV lines intermittently reading occluded, so we would check that. Um, but we think it was more to positioning. I'll touch on that during lessons learned. Let's see, so she was initially <clears throat> Um, admitted to the outside hospital on the 25th, upgraded to the ICU there on the 7th of January, and then transferred to Johns Hopkins for ECMO evaluation on the 8th, which was also the same day that she got proned and started on nitric. Um, she was proned until January 29th when she was um, able to be supinated. During that time between the 7th and the 29th, she did require nitric twice for extra O2 support. And she was successfully extubated on the 7th of February. So she was intubated for one month in entirety. On the 8th of February, she was transitioned to one of our medicine step down units. And then um, last week down to an inpatient rehab unit. And hopefully by the end of this week, She'll be heading home, we're fingers crossed. So the last time I checked in on that. Um, let's see. So for lessons learned from this tra transport, um, if something's working, keep it. Why, why try and fix what's not broken? So I was one of the members of the team that brought in our first prone patient before we had protocols and everything in place. And it was just like, all right, let's, let's make a plan, let's call medical command and see how this works. This seems to be working for the patient. I don't wanna supinate them, have them decompensate and then you know, go crazy with things. So once we had a protocol and we had everything going on, it was just like, okay, I wanna make sure we're doing right sideline, we're doing this. In retrospect, this patient, like I said, she was taken care of very well in this outside facility. Skin looked great, ET tube was good. She was appropriately sedated. Her left facing position was really good. In the interest of saving time and not, you know, moving the patient as much as we did, we could have kept her in the left side facing, you know, the left facing swimmer's position and just put that ET tube holder on her um, and even kept the same bolstering. My hesitation was at the head of the bed in the AMBO not being able to visualize the airway appropriately, but we could have. And then also we would have had better access to her left femoral central line um, if she had been more sick than that. And we had to do more fiddling with the lines and things weren't good. And she was on, you know, multiple pressers that really could have caused an issue with lines occluded and stuff. So um, she was safe the whole time. We just could have really cut down on on-scene and in-room time and extra effort on our team side. Um, 
let's see. And then another lesson learned was delegating tasks and working independently, but as a team. We went in one by one into the room. The RT took care of all the respiratory equipment. Obviously, we would have helped her if she had asked. You know, we each owned something. Someone transitioned over the drip. Someone started getting the equipment ready for the proning. And communication was key with everything. So we made sure we were all on the same page. Are you ready? Who's leading the move? I have this here. Make sure we're doing this. Um, so having, having the good communication and teamwork in the final packaging uh, to make it successful and a safe transfer of patient to the stretcher, the transport stretcher in a timely manner, keeping in mind that you know you have limited supplies and then getting them down to the rig. And um, that's pretty much it for this patient. Thanks, Holly, for that great presentation. Uh, so staying with the ground transport, I'm going to turn this over to Bridget for our third and final case presentation of a patient who we transported in November. Bridget. Well, good morning, everyone. So briefly, just a little about me. Um, I, like Sean, have a good amount of experience proning as an ICU nurse. However, I am also new to transporting prone patients and relatively new to transport in general. I've been doing this for about a year now. So to dive into the case, this is a 51-year-old female with a past medical history of diabetes, asthma, and hypertension. Patient presented to the Sending Facilities um, Emergency Department on November 14th with eight days of flu-like symptoms, generally consistent with COVID. She had had a positive COVID test on day six, was ultimately admitted to a COVID floor on high-flow nasal cannula. 16 days later, on November 30th, she had to be upgraded to the MICU um, with severe COVID-induced ARDS. Same day, she was intubated, paralyzed, sedated, and proned. She remained difficult to ventilate and oxygenate with poor P to F ratios of particular concern. She had not been supinated since the initial prone on November 30th and the patient was for transfer to Johns Hopkins Cardiac ICU for ECMO cannulation. So here's kind of our doorway assessment. Um, patient was prone, appeared generally stably unstable, adequately sedated and paralyzed on fentanyl, versed, and vecuronium for neuromuscular blockade. Also had a heparin drip up. Um, as you can see kind of unique vent settings. Um, this is a reference point. This patient was 5'4 and about 96 kilos. So that tidal volume of 220 was about three, three and a half cc's per kilo ideal body weight. The um, setting facility had been doing daily driving pressure trials, that being the plateau pressure minus the PEEP and had come to these settings based on the results of those. Um, they had achieved an uptrend in their oxygenation. This is a gas that was drawn shortly prior to our arrival on scene. So this was the best PAO2 they had achieved and the patient was compensating fairly well for the hypercarbia. So we were comfortable continuing with these settings based on our doorway assessment. So we, like everyone else, spent about 20 to 30 minutes on scene, getting a plan, um, mapping out all of our logistics, which we did a great job of. Unfortunately, that all went out the window when we went into the room to assess the airway and um, found a couple red flags. First, um, we know that any airway, any facial or neck edema associated with the prone position is going to automatically increase your risk of airway compromise, regardless of how your tube is secured. Um, this one was secured with twill tape with a single knot. Um, we did find, unfortunately, one to two centimeters of tube slippage and a copious amount of blood tin secretions pulling from the mouth. Next slide. So our immediate priority immediately transitioned to confirming the integrity of our tube and securing our tube. So we ended up reconsulting, repeating a chest x-ray tube was in place. Um, something about the transfer environment makes it a little bit different from the ICU environment is that even though the tube was good at this point, every prone to prone interfacility transport is going to necessitate at least five to 10 distinct patient movements. 
So whereas something might be secure for a patient prone in the ICU, it might need a little extra reinforcement in the transport world. So our protocols um, call for the patient to be supinated ideally and have a Thomas tube holder placed. Um, unfortunately, the general consensus here was that the patient would not tolerate supination. After much discussion with our medical direction, the transport team, and the primary care team at Sending, we decided to go ahead and have the most experienced provider uh, secure the tube, who at that point was the lead respiratory therapist, had a considerable, a considerable amount of experience um, securing prone tubes. So they ended up doing that under anesthesia oversight, uneventfully went well. Um, we, for extra monitoring, added a end title in line when we put the patient on our ventilator. So just some general thoughts and considerations here. Uh, if you want to back up, just one. Thanks, sorry. Um, questions to ask yourself, who should do it? Obviously, we went with the most experienced provider. One of the downsides we kind of came to find out there, though everything went well, tube was placed safely um, and stayed in place for the rest of transport. You do at that point end up maybe using a securement device or method that you would not have preferred. For example, we in our program, like the Thomas tube holder, we ended up using cloth tape, which is a close second in terms of strength and securement. Um, might also even advantage over some of the commercial tube holders um, in terms of skin integrity and preventing skin breakdown. But in this case too, we might kind of lose some of that advantage because the copious secretions are gonna decrease the um, adhesion of the tape. So kind of a lot of things in play. Um, next slide, please. Luckily, um, patient was packaged uneventfully and about a 15 minute transport to Johns Hopkins, didn't have to do any interventions en route, no issues in the rest of transport and patient was ultimately cannulated on arrival to the CCU at Hopkins, remained on VV ECMO for almost a month, um, but was ultimately weaned off of both ECMO and even mechanical ventilation and on January 29th was transferred to skilled nursing for rehab. So overall, a pretty positive outcome. So lessons learned here um, with kind of the building evidence to support um, proning of the COVID patient. I think we're going to see a lot more outlying facilities proning patients for the first time. Also probably could expect to see more patients with extended prone times. That being said, something that I'm going to change and incorporate into my practice is expediting an assessment. Um, not at all to take away on the importance of pre-planning and logistics, but maybe add in a kind of divide and conquer method where one person goes in and does an assessment while someone else consults and continues coordinating logistics and supplies outside the room, just so that you can identify some of these crucial patient factors like your tube integrity and pivot and have more efficient reduced scene times. Um, just so that, yeah. So this uh, call in particular had a really extended scene time, um, several hours. And in particular, most of that was spent um, securing the ET tube um, almost two hours, as you can see. And then my, our main recommendation and my biggest takeaway here is to consider placing a commercial tube holder over the existing ties, tape, whatever it is that you find on scene. Um, as we've heard, Holly did this successfully. Um, it's been done successfully in the past. Um, there was a group out of Massachusetts who um, last spring and summer did about 25 um, mechanically ventilated COVID prone transports. And as part of their methods and their protocols, they always add a commercial holder over top of whatever device they have that they found. And this group had no adverse events in transport. So that would include any kind of tube migration, dislodgement, hypoxic events, or hemodynamic instability. So the evidence speaks to it. And then if you're someone like me who perhaps has more ICU experience um, and usually had respiratory there to tape and secure your tubes for you, I think that the tube holder um, on top of the twill tapes or ties could add a level of confidence and comfort and is also safer. Um, maybe something that other people will be confident in incorporating into their practice. 
and that's my that's my case. Great, thanks so much, Bridget. Great case, great presentation. So before we uh, take it home and summarize a few take home points, uh, we've received a few questions about the characteristics of some of the other prone patients we transported. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sean Troutman to briefly review that and then we'll conclude the talk. Thank you, so um, we definitely wanna leave time for question and answer. So I'll go over this quickly and uh, you can reach out to me if you have more questions. Uh, so total, total number of transports we've done since the beginning of the pandemic till now is uh, 15 transports. Uh, most of them were by grounds. Uh, so we did 13 by ground and we've done two by air. Um, one thing to note is majority of them were also mechanically ventilated, uh, 13 of them, but two of them actually were not ventilated. They're what we call self-prone, which is kind of a new thing with COVID as well. And those patients were on uh, high flow nasal cannula. Um, a lot of questions also about inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. Uh, four of our patients uh, were on inhaled uh, uh, pulmonary vasodilators, three of them prior to arrival and one we initiated. So go ahead, uh, next slide. And this is just our slide about the interventions. Um, we, uh, like I said, we. Um, uh, one other thing is, uh, 13 of our patients were already in the prone position, and two we actually initiated uh, prone transport on. Um, we did ventilator changes on 11 of the 13 ventilated patients. So majority of our patients were were doing ventilator changes, and the majority of that were increasing their respiratory rate and decreasing their total volume. Uh, uh, um, as far as uh, other interventions, we were, uh, the biggest thing was hemodynamic uh, uh, vasopressor adjustment. And we actually, majority of the time, were able to decrease the dose of the uh, vasopressors, which is interesting. Um, and I think goes to show how, how much uh, oxygen helps these patients. Um, and in two cases, we actually titrated off. Um, adverse event, no dislodgements, uh, whether that's uh, ET tube or um, uh, any line. So uh, that's great. Um, the only uh, adverse event we had was actually in one patient, and they had two, uh, two adverse events. They had hypoxia, and they had some bradycardia. Um, and actually, I think the hypoxia went, went first, and then bradycardia. And uh, that, was being, that was able to be uh, addressed uh, by the paralytics that Sam mentioned. And once we did that, the patient was, uh, did a great job after that. So. All right, so that brings us to the end of the session. But before we open it up for questions, I did just want to summarize a few take home points. So first, starting with the initial call intake to ensure the right resources arrive at patient side is critical. Uh, needs based competency education and training will allow your program to move from concept to implementation. Uh, we can do it safely. I think you all have seen that. Um, and like with so many things in medicine, preparation is key. With respect to the cases, case one demonstrated that even after optimization of the patient, if proning is still indicated, do it because it works. Case two, we saw that bedside time can be reduced significantly by going with what is working, provided it will also work in the transport environment. And lastly, with case three, bedside time can be reduced and complexity decreased by using commercial tube holders over existing tapes and ties rather than exchanging devices in a patient who is proned. Okay, so with that, um, we're gonna open up to some questions. I know Dr. Garfinkel and Sean Troutman and Ben have been answering some of them in the chat already. Uh, but if Sean, if you wanna start handling some of these questions, we have about seven minutes left. Yeah, great. Uh, we get, we've gotten some awesome, uh, some awesome questions. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to get through them all. So please reach out um, to myself or Dr. Margolis uh, if we don't get to your question and we can, we can try to dialogue more uh, offline there. Um, so one question I think that we can address is a couple questions about uh, sort of the size of the patient. We had a question about um, um, how big will we transfer this patient's prone and also about uh, height too. So um, does anybody on the panel want to talk about what we do with, uh, with that? So I'll take that one, Sean. Um, so I think that the the height thing is tough. Uh, we're lucky that most of our stretchers can can handle a, a pretty tall patient um, and get them up as far as possible. The weight thing, 
is a little bit harder to, to answer. And I think it's, it's dependent on the crew. Um, I don't think we've got a hard number. Um, I, I think it's just a question of, do you feel like if you emergently needed to supinate the patient, could you get them rolled over? Um, and, and with the team you've got, uh, and that's one of the reasons we sent that, we decided to send that third, excuse me, that third person um, was essentially for manpower. Um, and, and if we did need to emergently uh, supinate them. Uh, additionally, for me on the aircraft, I probably have a lower threshold for obesity uh, or for weight of the patient uh, because I can get myself into a much less favorable position to emergently supinate them. Um, so I, I know that's not a definitive answer and hopefully it answers the question, um, but I don't think we've got anything in black and white written down on like a, a a go no go point. Uh, I, I think it really comes down to to the crew. Do you think you do you think you could emergently supinate this patient uh, if need be, uh, given your transport vehicle and uh, and your manpower? Yeah, and just to add on to that, the only thing we do have written in black and white is that uh, if the patient's BMI is greater than forty, we uh, we we just consider taking a bariatric stretcher to give more room for the patient. Uh, but that's really the only thing. Other than that, it's a clinical assessment. And someone had asked about height versus weight. I have to be honest with you, most of these patients that we brought in, height has not been an issue. It's been more, uh, well, width or girth. So their yep. weight and their, um, for their height, their BMI, like Sean was saying. Um, another question, uh, Asa, I'm going to give this one to you. Uh, the question is about uh, uh, applying this to the 911 setting. Is there any application for proning in 911 emergency settings? Yeah, it's a great question and one we often get. Um, I would say first and foremost, you know, the, the self-proning um, is certainly something you can consider, right? The patient has a pain in airway, uh, they have appropriate mental status, um, they can certainly self-prone provided you obviously you're able to secure them safely to the stretcher. So that's one. Um, with respect to proning uh, intubated patients, in the 911 setting. So you, you know, you go to a patient, um, they're in arrest or you RSI them, you intubate them, you're having trouble oxygenating despite using, you know, high flow oxygen and turning your PEEP up. Um, you know, can you prone them? You can, but a couple of things. One, it needs to be well practiced. You need to have a protocol, you need to have education, you need to have training, you need to review with your medical directors. But also, you know, the, the transport time in our 911 jurisdictions obviously are typically shorter than they are for interfacility transport. So you may not get the same benefit if you're only doing it for a short period of time. And the time it takes for you to actually make the movements and get them into the prone position safely is going to exceed the out of hospital time. So it's really a, a risk benefit or weighing the, the transport duration. Um, with how long the intervention is going to take. And so I would certainly look at self-proning and then intubating the prone patient differently with being able to self-prone as something that most EMS jurisdictions should be able to apply, again, provided uh, the patient's able to be secured safely to the, to the stretcher. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. That's awesome. Um, another question, we got a lot of questions about um, inhaled uh, pulmonary vasodilators. So I just want to address uh, what we do right now and then uh, um, maybe our end docs can discuss uh, a little bit between uh, the pluses and minuses of those uh, versus proning. We, um, uh, Hopkins is sort of right now kind of an INO shop, that's what they prefer. Um, uh, if we are going to do any kind of uh, inhaled pul vaso, uh, pulmonary vasodilators, we use the Mallinckrodt system currently, although there is some, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll stay with them, but right now we use Mallinckrodt, which provides a, a control module and has a battery and you use the nitric tanks. Um, and then uh, if we did have to uh, transport uh, Velitri or, or, or something else, uh, we would use the Aerogen as our nebulizing uh, device, um, which uh, you can get with uh, this USB power that we actually plug into our T1 ventilators um, and uh, we could put that into our ventilator circuit. Um, so those are the two uh, two things we do. Um, Dr. Margolis and team, do you guys want to discuss uh, uh, vasodilators versus proning? Sure. So you know they're both very very valuable tools, um, and I think they can be thought of differently. So 
you know, we know based on some of the literature that proning and what we've seen thus far in, co in COVID, that proning really works well and has a beneficial effect um, with respect to oxygenation and mortality. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate this successfully. Uh, there's certainly a role for inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, um, and that can be thought of, in, in, at least in the transport world, as sometimes a bridge to getting them to potentially an ECMO center. Um, the thing with inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, uh, particularly INO, uh, is that there is no proven mortality benefit, and there is some expense involved in the therapy. Um, so weighing that um, with obviously needing to provide enough oxygenation to get the patient to the transport, uh, through the transport and to the referring facility, I think are important considerations. So again, uh, there's nothing that definitively says that pulmonary vasodilators is going to increase your mortality, uh, sorry, is going to decrease your mortality, uh, but there is evidence to suggest that it may improve uh, oxygenation transiently, and that may be what's needed to get them to an ECMO center so they can get on ECMO. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to the panel, and thank you, everybody. I think that we're about out of time. Um, so please, a um, couple things. If we didn't get to your answer, uh, your question, please email us because we want to answer your questions. This was a great conversation. We should have scheduled more time for questions. Uh, but the second thing is, if you're looking for credit, um, please uh, complete the link. Uh, you can scan it here. We're also going to send it out via email. Um, and then the... Um, uh, a lot of people have been asking about, like, uh, is this recorded and things like that. It is recorded, so I just have to figure out the best means to, uh, to distribute it. But keep an eye on your email, and we'll send that stuff out. Dr. Margolis, you want to close this out? Sure. Uh, so really, thank you to everybody who participated and who joined. We hope you learned something. We're able to take away a, a few valuable points uh, from our experience and our lessons learned. Uh, I want to give a, a very sincere thank you to this team, this team of panelists, um, our operations director, Heidi Hubble, um, our SORT coordinators, uh, Chad Bowman and Eric Leslie, um, all of the MDocs that participate with medical consultation, all the nurses, paramedics, EMTs that do this care and provide this outstanding level of care to our patients every day. Uh, truly honored and blessed to work with you all, so thank you very much. And uh, like Sean said, please send us any emails uh, of questions that you had that were not addressed during this session.